Are we ready for war with China while they test nuclear weapons, exponentially grow their armies, and send warships into waters near Taiwan? Our military is holding drag shows and filling diversity quotas. And the U.S. military is facing a recruitment crisis, no doubt, the worst since 1973, not to mention our commander-in-chief, heaven help us all, has pointed out to our biggest adversaries that we are low on munitions. A Biden-run military certainly doesn't instill confidence in the American people, to say the very least. But Florida governor and 2024 presidential candidate Ron DeSantis says he has a plan to root the woke virus out of Biden's military for good. You look at today's military, it's going woke. So as president and commander in chief on day one, we rip it all out of the military. All the Obama-Biden nonsense is gone. Well, that's music to a lot of people's ears. Governor DeSantis, my Florida governor and presidential candidate, joins us now. So we'll get to that in one second. If I can get you on the news of the day, we've been transfixed by the IRS whistleblower testimony today on the investigation into Biden's alleged corruption. What's your takeaway from the hearing, if you don't mind? Well, I haven't really had a chance to get debriefed on it yet, but I mean, I think that uh, the Biden family and the amount of money uh, that's been flowing into their coffers, and yet most people in the deep state have wanted to look the other way. What a contrast that is to how they handle Republicans. And so I think the Biden family needs to be held accountable. All right, Governor, you just made a major policy speech called Mission First, a plan to end wokeness in our military. We, we played a little soundbite from, from one of your ads. Do you think Let's talk a little bit about that. What, what, uh, uh, fantastic. I mean, uh, you watch South China, the South China Sea, you see them beefing up. You watch Russia learning how to fight kinetically, you know, with Ukraine. Then you look at us and we're worried about diversity in our military. Talk to us. Well, I'm a Navy veteran. I served in Iraq. I got to do a, a lot of things. And I was always very proud of that. And I think most veterans are very proud of having worn the cloth of their country. Many of them come up to me now and they say, I would not want my kids or grandkids joining today's military. Why? We see things like the Navy using drag queens for recruiting. You see the military services indulging in social experimentation at the expense of readiness, lethality. Um, and it's not good for morale. They have driven a lot of warriors off by those policies, as well as the unscientific COVID-19 vax mandates, which were not justifiable, particularly for these service members that had already recovered from COVID. And so now you have the worst recruiting since the end of the draft during the Vietnam era. You can't possibly compete with China if we're not attracting good people to want to serve in the military in adequate levels. And I look at to see some of the stuff that they're doing with the wokeness, with the politicization. China is laughing at us. Our military right now is concerned about things like climate change and how they do operations to ensure that they're reducing so-called carbon emissions. China doesn't care about that. China's going to burn all the coal they need to to be able to get the job done. So we're at a competitive disadvantage. Uh, we're at a recruiting deficit. Uh, morale is low, and we need to change. So we're going in day one. No more wokeness in the military. We're eliminating so-called DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion, uh, which is basically dividing people based on identity politics. I mean, Eric, you know you've been in team endeavors. When you join the military— it's not about you as an individual. Everyone's got their own things, but the question is, can that be put aside for the good of the unit? And I think what they're doing now is they're trying to elevate these differences and play social experimentation. So we're going to get rid of all of that. We're going to focus it back on mission. We'll have some changes for the, for the top brass, of course, but I think it's going to set a very good uh, standard, and I think you're going to see recruiting rebound as a result of getting it right. Do you have any idea? Uh, President DeSantis changes out his his cabinet. Obviously, who would who would be a good defense secretary uh, if if Austin is is failing, as you say, which I would agree with you. So what I what I can tell you is the qualities I would look for. I don't think you want somebody who has been a general officer recently. Lloyd Austin obviously has. So was Mattis. I supported Mattis when President Trump nominated him at the time. But I think what I've seen is those guys are too close 
to the the top brass because they've served with these guys. So I think you need somebody from outside. Yes, maybe someone that has military experience, but more importantly than that uh, is a strong leader and manager and is going to be willing to hold flag and general officers accountable for their performance. Right now, the things that are rewarded in the military is more about whether you're following the social agenda that the civilian elites want you to follow. I don't think George Patton could get beyond colonel in today's military because of what they're looking for. So you need a secretary of defense that's going to change those incentives. We want people who are going to be hard chargers. We want people who aren't going to deal with the political nonsense. Our military should be unique in society. It should not be a reflection of values at places like Goldman Sachs or civilian bureaucracies. And so we'll have a secretary of defense that understands that, that's going to have the backbone to be able to challenge the entrenched military industrial complex. Complex, uh, and that's going to do things to increase morale inside the Pentagon and our services. Very, very important. Sir, let's uh, turn the topic to Trump. There's so many things going on with Trump. He, he announced that he will likely be indicted. He's, he's got a letter. He's the subject uh, of a likely indictment. And you came to his defense yesterday uh, uh, over on CNN. Do you think his indictment or this whole indictment palooza, as we're calling it, are they politically motivated? So here's what I think. If you go back to the Alvin Bragg case, what did Bragg do? Bragg took a business record statute and he stretched it to basically try to get these payments that, that Trump's people you know, made back in the day. Nobody would have been prosecuted under that in normal course of business, but because it was Trump, he wanted to go after. I, I, we don't know what's going to happen with this J6 thing. Um, you know, I hope that there's not charges brought. But what they've been doing is they've been using the statute called obstruction of a proceeding, and they've kind of been stretching that to fit conduct that may or may not have happened on January 6th. And I think if they do that, people are going to look at it and say, look, Nobody's above the law. If, if Donald Trump or any big political person you know, gets caught robbing a bank or doing things that we know are traditional crimes that people get prosecuted for every day, um, you know, that's just the way the cookie crumbles. But I think when you try to shove conduct into some of these more opaque statutes and you're running with that, given the politicization of the Garland Justice Department, you know, you're going to have a lot of people that are going to look at that and wince. One thing, though, I think we need to do when I become president, I've already said new FBI director, clean house at DOJ and weaponization will, of will, justice will, will you, in this country. Will you, will, we you need pro will you prosecute FBI director Ray? A lot of people like to see that. Would you prosecute um, my orcas. A lot of people would like to see that. So it's one thing cleaning house and getting rid of them. I think, you know, again, we'll stay on this Trump topic. He's promised to not only get rid of them, but maybe even perp walk some of them. Well, yeah, but I mean, I think all, you know, look, I was at the rallies in 2016. I was cheering about lock her up, lock her up with Hillary, and that didn't end up happening. So a single standard of justice to me means that elites who are uh, uh, on the side of the ruling elite in D.C., that they're held accountable, just like the rest of us who may be opposing those elites. But one of the things I do think we need to do, Eric, and if this case does proceed in D.C., I think people are going to see why. Uh, I think an American has a right, if they're charged in D.C., to remove that case to wherever their home of record is in that judicial district. Because what happens in D.C., it's like a 95% very hostile liberal jury pool. So if you're somebody who's kind of against the swamp on the right, you are going to get eaten up and spit out by these people. So, so I so, don't think it's a fair forum. I so think we need... This is yep. very interesting. I, I'm, I'm glad you said that because it, it begs the question, if you are elected president and Donald Trump is, in fact, indicted, incarcerated even, would you pardon him if you feel that way? Oh, well, I've said, I've said from the beginning... Uh, to have a former president that's almost 80 years old uh, go to prison, uh, that is not good uh, for this country. And so as president, you know, I'm, I have the pardon power as governor and I've exercised it. And obviously you got to look at the facts at, at, at the time that it happens. And it is all a case by case determination. And there's different reasons why you would pardon. But one of the reasons is, is this something that's in the best interest of society. And uh, I fail to see how that would be good for this country uh, to see something like that happen. 
I don't think it's going to come to that. I think he's maintained his innocence. Uh, but, you know, we need to, I think we need to focus on the people's business looking forward. Uh, and we got to stop uh, criminalizing political differences. Sir, have you changed your Trump strategy? So, you know, you and I have talked quite a bit, you, you know, on the show and, and elsewhere. It, you didn't come out of the box attacking Donald Trump. It seems like maybe some of the ads have moved a, a little bit more towards that, although you are defending him when, on some of these indictment things. Has the Trump strategy changed? And can you weigh in on whether or not you, well, you think he should be on that debate stage in August? He says he might not. And is that a mistake? Sure. So, so first of all, when I got elected, uh, or excuse me, when I announced my candidacy in May, I was asked uh, questions about Trump criticizing me. I hit back very directly, but it was on substance. What I'm not going to do is I'm not going to attack him personally. I'm not going to call him names. I'm not going to do that. That's just not my style, not my cup of tea. Uh, but we've been very uh, direct where there's differences on policy. Uh, we identify that, um, and we can let the people uh, decide. In terms of the debate, yeah, I think he ought to debate. I'm going to debate. I'm going to be there. I think it's a great opportunity for us to have a great discussion uh, about the country's future. Nobody's entitled to be nominated. You got to earn it. And I think he should show up and make his case and, and answer questions like the rest of us. The end of the day, this country's in decline. We all see that. We all know that. Uh, I'm running because I want to reverse the decline, get us on a fundamentally different path. And I think if you know we go in for two terms starting January 20th, 2024, Five, you know, we're going to be very active, very energetic. We're going to spit nails. Uh, and we're going to bring all this stuff in for a landing, and the country will be better off for it. Mm. Um, initially, you came up very strongly against the Ukraine war, supporting the war, and you said it was a territorial dispute. I think you've clarified your comments since then, but the war seems to be in, in a quagmire. The, the counteroffensive has slowed. What's your take right now as we speak on the Ukraine war, and how do you think you as president would end that crisis Recently, you know, I don't know, Trump said he could do it in a day or so. But how would you do it? Well, uh, so first of all, I think w what is kind of the, the, the state of play here? The initial Russian invasion, I think the goal was for them to topple the Ukrainian government and impose a Belarus-style puppet state in Ukraine that Moscow would have influence over. Obviously, they didn't succeed in that. It was a huge failure. So the fight is over that territory in the very far eastern part of Ukraine. Uh, they're battling over different uh, uh, parts of the territory there. Now, uh, I think that we need to do uh, uh, bring it in for a landing. Uh, I want to see a sustainable peace. We don't, we're not going to reward regression, but I think we're on the pathway right now to have a multi-year stalemate where a lot of blood is spilled, a lot of money spent, a lot of weapons are used, and there's not going to be much of a difference in outcome. So what I said is, President, I'm going to use the levers I have uh, to try to bring about the sustainable peace. I don't think you can just make a phone call, with all due respect to the former president, but what I will do is I will use our, our levers of energy. Biden won't do that because he cares more about the Green New Deal. We're going to get rid of the Green New Deal. Uh, we're going to export more energy. We're going to make it so that Europeans aren't going to need Russian energy. We're also going to turn the screws on Iran. Uh, Biden has empowered Iran with sanctions relief. They're Russia's number one benefactor. Mm -hmm. So Biden is funding both sides of this conflict. So we will do that to put pressure on Russia. But I don't think we can say that we have a blank check uh, going to Ukraine indefinitely the way the D.C. foreign policy elite is doing. And what they're doing is they're ignoring our own border here at home, which I would make a big priority. They're also making it less likely that we're projecting the type of hard power in Indo-Pacific to be able to deter China. There are things that should be going to Taiwan. There's other parts of our military we need to be building up to deal with the China threat, which in my judgment is by far the top threat that this country faces. Indeed. And we're going on a course now with Biden where I fear we're going to end up in a war with China that we could lose uh, sometime in the future. Indeed, indeed. The vacuum of power, vacuum of strength, uh, certainly not portraying strength on the world stage. Very quickly, I know you got to go, sir. Uh, Casey, how's she doing? How's the campaign going with her? How is she? She is doing great, and she launched the Mamas for DeSantis movement. And that's why NBC is upset, because parents right now know that their rights are under assault. We in Florida have stood up for him. We're going to stand up for him as president. And my wife is an incredible advocate 
for the well-being of children and the rights of parents. The left knows that. They know she's effective. They know she's over the target. So, of course, how do they respond? They try to smear her. But she's strong. She understands that's just part of the game. And I couldn't be more proud of her. Her health is 100 percent. And our kids are Amen. rambunctious as always, but they're having good time. So Amen. thanks for asking. I, I, I always do this with you before we go, sir. It's, you know, third Wednesday in July is National Hot Dog Day. i got to ask you, what does Ron DeSantis put on his hot dog? Mustard. Straight up, that's it? That's it. All right, good for you, good for you. A traditionalist, Governor Ron DeSantis, really appreciate it. Thank you for joining us. Thank you.